In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation on this beautiful Sunday. And this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it on this beautiful Sunday, a day in which we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For that reason, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And may the joy of the Lord be our strength, as we read from Nehemiah. May the joy of the Lord be our strength. So as always, always we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Yesterday we celebrated the beautiful feast day of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And the day before we celebrated the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Beautiful feast days. So we'd like to start off our conversation as always by inviting Mary to be with us. As we say the prayer that Mary loves most. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Let's say that prayer that Mary loves so much. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's invite to our Perseverance Family conversation, our spiritual director. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has many beautiful titles, among which are the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. The Holy Spirit is also known as the sanctifier. He's also known as the gift of gifts. The Holy Spirit is a sweet guest of our souls. The Holy Spirit is our counselor in moments of doubt. The Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler in midst of desolation. The Holy Spirit is also known as our interior master. In the words of St. Paul, we don't know how to pray as we ought. We don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Abba, which means father or daddy. So as we start off this new week, Sunday is the day of the Lord. Let us invite the Holy Spirit to be with us and to give us a lot of light in our intellect. Let's also beg for a lot of joy in our hearts that our, heart, our hearts and our souls will be filled with the fire of divine love. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to give us. Light and love. And long life in this life as well as the next. Let's turn to the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. And enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Anthony of Padua, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Pray that you all have a very happy and joyful Sunday. Sunday is the day in which we celebrate with great joy the Blessed Trinity, but also we celebrate every Sunday the Paschal Mystery, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So every Sunday should be a mini Easter for us, a day of great joy and rejoicing. So as always, as is my custom, I would like to fill you with a lot of joy in the sense that today I will be praying for all of you. I would like to pray for you in the Opus Dei, Opus Dei, which means the work of God. I'd like to place all of you on the altar. I'd like to place all of you on the altar in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And as always, I'd like to offer three intentions. The first will be that on this Sunday, the 11th Sunday in Ordinary Time, in the Church liturgical cycle, that you would be filled with joy. That this would be a very joyful day for all of you. It's important, my friends, that we try to cultivate a spirit of joy in our hearts. Philip Neri said, Tristeza and melancholia fuera de casa mia. Sadness and melancholiness get out of my house. We, all, we have all the reasons in the world why we should rejoice because God loves us. Jesus loves us. Mary loves us. St. Joseph loves us. God's angels and saints have a great love for us, and that should fill us with joy because part of our, persons, our perseverance family would be heaven. I invite all of heaven to be with us. I invite all the angels to be with us in our Perseverance family talk. So it's a it's a big family. Invite you also to share our conversations with others. Invite some of your friends to become part of our family. My second intention, and I know this intention is very important for all of you, is the following. Is the following that your children will be blessed in a very special way. That God would bless all of you and your children. Your children would be blessed in a very, very special way. Your children and your teenagers. Your children and your teenagers. Never have we lived in a more challenging time in the history of the world as we're, we're going through right now. But as St. Augustine says, God allows evil to bring greater good out of evil. And as Charles Dickens said, the worst of times can be the best of times. And we know this, that Jesus can turn tragedy into victory. in the most surprising ways. He can turn tragedy into victory. So that's my second intention. My third intention will be that all of you, all of us, will have a real desire to want to pray more and to pray better. 
because our spiritual life, our growth in holiness, our conversion, our sanctification, and our perseverance in our spiritual life depends a lot upon our prayer life. So I pray that all of you will have a great longing for deeper and deeper prayer. And finally, I'd like to just thank God, thank you, thank many people that were involved. Yesterday we had a first communion in Spanish. We'll have another one next Saturday. So let's pray for the children that made their first communion and their parents. I would invite you to pray for them, that they and their parents would persevere in their prayer life. The parents would be good educators to the children because the first educators or teachers of children are the parents. Second, I'd like to thank God because yesterday we had a very, very beautiful mass of consecration at 12 noon in which after a period of a month preparation, meditating upon the message of Fatima with the children Jacinta and Francisco. We had many people in the church and hundreds of people online that were consecrating their families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Yesterday was the Immaculate Heart of Mary through the prayers and intercession of St. Jacinta and Francisco. So I thank all who were involved in this wonderful project that we've had over the past month. The consecration of families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary through the intercession of Saint Jacinta Marto and her brother Francisco. So I'm very thankful for that. So my friends, today is Sunday and there's so much to cover today. We have the first reading taken from Ezekiel, which he compares us to a branch that's plucked out and planted on the top of the mountain. Then we have the responsorial psalm where we pray, Lord, it is good to give thanks to you, an attitude of gratitude. We want to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Then the second read is taken from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, in which he speaks about two homes, our physical home and our home in heaven. And St. Paul says, we live by faith and not by sight. Okay? He says we live by faith and not by sight. And then he says that we will be judged, our actions will be judged, we will receive a rec recompense for the good or the evil that we've done. In the Gospel reading, Jesus gives us two parables. The parable of the seed that's planted and little by little it grows at night without our knowing. Then the blade comes forth it grows, it flourishes, and it's ready for to be cut and to be harvested. Then Jesus says, he gives another parable of the mustard seed. The mustard seed, which is the smallest of seed, but when it grows, it becomes the largest of all plants. This is that Jesus spoke in parables. Jesus spoke in parables, these little stories. But then to his apostles, he explained them all in private. So in a nutshell, those are the readings we have for today, and we'd like to go deeper into these readings. But uh, I thought it would be very important for us today to speak a little bit about the saint that we would celebrate today. S 
because on when we Sunday mass, the the saints that we celebrate basically, they're I don't like to like I don't like to use the word suppress. But the Sunday mass always has has uh, greater importance over any of the saints, unless it's a solemnity like uh, the Immaculate Conception, or maybe it's the uh, Saint Peter and Saint Paul, or some solemnity. So the saint that we celebrate today is one of the most famous saints in the church. So I'd like to talk about him, <clears throat> and I'd like to I'm going to try to relate the late the life of the saint to the to the readings that I've just explained uh, succinctly. So every year on the 13th of June we celebrate Saint Anthony. Today is Saint Anthony of Padua. Saint Anthony of Padua. So let's talk a little bit about him and see how God clipped off St. Anthony like a branch and he placed him on the top of the mountain so that abundant fruits could be bring forth, brought forth. See Anthony as the first reading of Ezekiel. Uh, a shoot, a branch was cut off and it was taken and placed on the top of the mountain. That's what really he would do. He was taken from a little convent and placed on the top of the mountain to become one of the greatest preachers. And how it came about was fascinating. We'll talk about that. I don't think St. Anthony ever thought that he would be such a great renowned preacher. He was very content just to be in the monastery and to do humble tasks and do his reading and his writings and his, and his fastings and his prayers. But God called him to be one of the greatest lights, one of the biggest branches, blossoming and bringing forth abundant fruit. So let's get to know St. Anthony and let's connect him to the Word of God, the seed that is small, but it grows and grows and it flourishes. And the mustard seed. He was like the mustard seed in a certain sense. So his name is St. Anthony of Padua. First thing I say that may shock you is that a lot of people think that St. Anthony was Italian because his body is buried in Padua, Italy. But actually, St. Anthony was born around the year 1195 and died in the year 1231. He was only 36 years of age, and he died on June 13th. He died today. So often we celebrate the saints we celebrate the saints on the day in which they die. Because the church believes that the death of the saint is his birthday into heaven. Sounds paradoxical, huh? St. Paul says in the second reading, I have my home here, but my real home is in heaven. So St. Anthony had his home on earth for 36 years. Now St. Anthony has his home in heaven. St. Paul says we long to arrive at that home in heaven. But he was not born in Padua. He was actually born in Portugal, in Lisbon. And he was canonized. Listen to this. It took Juan Diego about 450 years to be canonized. Joan of Arc about 500 years. St. Anthony died in the year 1231. You know when he was canonized? The year 1232. Rarely has a saint been canonized so quickly. Within one year, within one year, St. Anthony of Padua was canonized a saint. In other words, far and wide, there was a popular claim that this man was a great saint. No one denied it. One year, within one year, this man was canonized as a saint in the Catholic Church. Now he's the patron saint of many things. All of you know him to be the patron saint of lost articles, of childless women, of the poor, of harvests, 
of travelers, of horses and donkeys. We talked about that last week. And he's known as the, as the patron saint of Portugal. So today in Portugal, they're celebrating with great festivity, St. Anthony. And often this day in Portugal, this would be the day in people, children would be making their first communions on the feast day of St. Anthony. So, St. Anthony of Padua. Okay, what do we know about him? Uh, these are some of the details of his life, and let's try to get to know and love him better and better. He's going to be part of our Perseverance family. Surprising to you, probably, his name that he was given at birth was Ferdinand. In Spanish, it will be Fernando. So Ferdinand was actually his birth name. And even when he was very young, he felt called to become a religious. So first, St. Anthony entered into the Augustinians, founded obviously by St. Augustine. Okay, so he, was, he entered into the Augustinians. But something happened that caused him to change orders and the whole direction of his life. You're going to see in the life of St. Anthony the work of divine providence, how God intervened in many, many ways to bring this man to the heights of holiness. So what happened was the bodies of five Franciscans who had been tortured and martyred in Morocco and Africa were brought home from Morocco to Portugal to be buried. So Anthony was listening to the adventures of these great saints, these heroic men. And this lit a flame in the heart of St. Anthony. So he joined the Franciscans and he sailed to Morocco. So what his desire, his desire was this. He wanted to follow in the footsteps of these five Franciscans who were actually tortured and martyred in Morocco. He wanted to be he wanted to be a martyr like Saint Francis. Saint Francis went to the Holy Land expecting to be martyred. It didn't happen to him. Nor was Saint Anthony to die the death of a martyr. So being there in Morocco, Anthony's health was not that good. So he became ill and decided that because his health had really declined to return to Portugal. To return to Portugal. But God, God see how God intervenes. He intervenes with the death of these martyrs. Now God is going to intervene in another way. As Anthony was sailing back to Portugal, God allowed a storm, God allowed a storm to descend upon the sea where he was traveling. And what happened was because of the storm, the boat never arrived at Portugal, but it ended up on the shore of Sicily in Italy. So after a few months, he made his way from Sicily to Assisi in Italy. And apparently there were, the Franciscans were holding a very important meeting. And probably, probably St. Francis 
of Assisi was there who was old, frail, and was not going to be living many many more years. So St. Anthony probably met St. Francis of Assisi. So Anthony, he joined the Franciscans. He joined the Franciscans. What was the physical appearance? He was uh, a small man, a little bit kind of chubby, not very impressive his just his physical stature. He was a very quiet man, very modest, very prayerful, very obedient very dedicated to becoming just a very good religious. And what he did was he just dedicated to the humble, hidden, inconspicuous services in the in the monastery. Nobody really had any idea that he had he was given in extraordinary graces as a preacher. Now, even though he lived 36 years of age, he, he was he's considered in the Catholic Church one of the greatest preachers in the history of Catholicism. Nobody in the monastery had the faintest idea that Anthony had so many gifts because of his modesty, his humility, not very attractive, probably very soft-spoken, and he spent long hours in prayer and meditation and penance and obedience. Okay, we're, we're talking about divine providence. First, the martyrs of Morocco moves him to the Franciscans. Second, the bad climate of Morocco forces him to leave that country, that continent. Third, you've got the storm on the sea, he doesn't end up in Portugal, he ends up in Sicily. Now Anthony is in the monastery and there's an ordination. There's a, an ordination for Franciscans. And what happened? The priest who was supposed to give the homily the priest who was supposed to give the homily, he never showed up. He never showed up. So what happened? There was no one to preach the homily for the ordination mass. <clears throat> Therefore, the superiors not having anyone to preach, the Holy Spirit enlightened them and said, well, we have no one to preach. Why don't we ask uh, Father Anthony if he could give the ordination homily? Anthony, obviously he had no preparation for this homily. He didn't really want to give it. I felt he even he probably didn't even feel prepared to give this homily. So <clears throat> he gave the homily, and the brothers and the priests was Saint Francis there? Maybe. The brothers and the priests were so impressed by his eloquence by his knowledge of scripture by his unction they were so so impressed by his preaching skills and this is the the first time that he really preached preach publicly to such a big audience that the Franciscans that heard him they could not doubt 
that he was called to be a preacher and teacher. Even though St. Anthony did, did, did not seek this out himself, but God called him. So what happened was, St. Anthony was first called to basically teach and preach and form the early Franciscans. Charity begins at home. So don't forget when St. Francis lived, there was an explosion of vocations. I think this was the time in which we never had so many vocations to religious order more numerous than in the time of St. Francis. Many priests and many, many brothers, and also you had the poor Clares founded by Francis and, and St. Clare of Assisi. So the number of Franciscans was basically skyrocketing. And there had to, there had to be formation of the brothers and the priests, and they felt that Anthony could give them classes, which he did. He was very, very obedient and submissive to his superiors. So, what happened? They decided that he should preach not simply at home, but also that St. Anthony should start to preach outside the monastery. So that he did. So he preached in Italy, in Belgium, and in France. Probably Anthony was gifted with languages. Don't forget, he's in Italy now. His first language was Portuguese, of course. Portuguese and Italian are very similar. These are the Latin languages, French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and Romanian. Those are called the Latin-based languages. So most likely he was given the gift of languages to be able to preach in these different countries. He was known to preach so powerfully that he converted, he, he, he converted huge multitudes of people. And one one of the titles that was given to St. Anthony, one of the titles given to St. Anthony would be he's known as the Hammer of the Heretics. I repeat, the Hammer of the Heretics. When St. Anthony lived, he lived at the same time uh, he lived at this St. Francis is going to be living at the same time as St. Dominic. So with Francis, you've got St. Anthony, you've got St. Clare, you've got St. Bonaventure, these great saints that are living at the same time in this Franciscan order. But also at the same time, you have the formation of another order, and they're called the OP, the Order of Preachers, founded by St. Dominic Guzman. So St. Dominic Guzman founded the Dominicans and, France, and Francis the Franciscans. Maybe you've heard me tell the story of the Pope, Pope Urban the Fourth, I think it was. Pope Urban the Fourth. Now see what's going to happen. Okay, the first reading in the gospel speaks about the, the branch that's planted on the top of the mountain and it flourishes. Talks about the seed that's planted and it grows. Talks about the mustard seed that's small 
and it's the smallest, but it flourishes. So we're seeing the whole idea of growth and growth and growth and renovation. So I'd like to connect the first reading of the Gospel reading to, to St. Anthony and St. Domini. The church was in decline, but God is going to take branches, Dominic and Francis, place it on the top of the mountain, and it's going to flourish. So Pope Urban IV, in the late, around the year 1200, around that time, the church was in great decline. The church is going through a tough time now. We can't, we can't deny that. The church was in decline. And Urban IV had this, had this vision or dream. He saw the church, and the church was crumbling to its very foundations. It was coming apart, coming unglued, so to speak. But what happened was the Pope looked, and he saw that the church was caving in, but he saw that there were two pillars that were supporting the church. These two pillars were two men. They were human pillars. And they were supporting the church so that the church would not cave in and crumble to its ruin. And one of them was St. Francis of Assisi, the other one was St. Dominic Guzman. And St. Francis would found the Franciscans and dominate the order of preachers known as the Dominicans. Because, my friends, and we have to pray to these saints that they would pray for us that we'd be able to lift up the church, that we'd be able to support the church, We'd be able to purify the church. That we, right now, that we become saints. And do all we possibly can. All we possibly can to be like Francis and Anthony and Dominic. To lift up the church by holy lives. Now the church had many problems as it does today. One was the, the church, worldliness and materialism had entered into the church, which there were clerics and those who were ministers of the Lord that were focusing more on the material life than on the spiritual life. They're focusing more on possessions than on souls. So God raised up, he raised up great St. Francis of Assisi to live, to, to live and to preach a return to gospel poverty. to gospel poverty. And that's what would bring people back to the church, seeing authentic priest, religious, living, living authentically the call to evangelical poverty. Now Dominic, St. Dominic, was different than Francis. He was a Spaniard. And Dominic, God called him to found the order of preachers. And their great contribution was, so Francis, Francis authentic poverty detachment, 
love for the poor, love for the lepers, love for the poor, the sick. And imitating Jesus and not living for material things, but trusting in divine providence. Dominic also lived a, a life, a very, very austere life of penance and fasting and mortification. But God called St. Dominic to form a group of brothers and priests dedicated to prayer, studying, preaching, and writing, and educating people. Because back then, there was just a lot of ignorance. A lot of ignorance. So here you have Francis, the turn return to gospel poverty in opposition to the worldly, worldliness that is set into the church. And then Dominic, the real importance of studying, first praying, studying, learning, so that they could teach and preach and educate people. For that reason, they're called the OP, the Order of Preachers. And these founders, Francis and Dominic, they attracted many people. Many people. And Fra Francis, he was living with other saints. St. Clair of Assisi, who lived a life of great poverty. St. Bonaventure, who lived at the time of St. Francis. St. Anthony of Padua, whose feast day we celebrate today. They all lived a life of great holiness, trying to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. So we might even ask ourselves, in honor of St. Anthony and St. Francis, have we given in to materialism? I say in the United States today, this is a greater danger. Have we given in to materialism? Are we focused more on money and buying and our possessions and consumerism, keeping up with the Joneses, having more and more materially, compulsive buying, that is the perennial temptation for those who live in the United States, even though we're hopefully coming to the tail end of a pandemic of 15 months. Still, there's a perennial temptation for us to allow our possessions to possess us. That seed of the word of God, which is the gospel, cannot grow and flourish in our hearts if we have within our hearts a disordered desire for material things, we cannot serve God and money and pleasure at the same time. Then we turn to Dominic. Remember the dream of the Pope, seeing these two men who are sustaining the church. They're the human pillars sustaining the church. St. Dominic insisted upon preaching and teaching. And back when he lived, there was a heresy called Albigensianism that Dominic and his followers would have to preach against Albigensianism. Dominic was surrounded by a star of great saints. Just think about this. During the lifetime of Dominic, we're going to have Listen to all the saints that live at the same time as Dominic. St. Albert the Great, known as the Universal Doctor. St. Albert the Great, known as the Universal Doctor, 
who was an expert in biology and chemistry and physics and mathematics and history and geography and philosophy and the Bible and theology. He was a genius. St. Albert the Great. St. Albert the Great had a student that would go beyond him and that was St. Thomas Aquinas. known as the angelic doctor. At the same time, there lived St. Raymond of Penafort, who would go on to be, like Anthony, a great preacher. Anthony only lived to be 36. Raymond of Penafort lived to be almost 100 years. So the last 40 years of his life, he dedicated himself to preaching. So God raised up these great saints. Franciscans, evangelical poverty, and then the Dominicans, the importance of preaching and teaching. So let's go back to St. Anthony. Let's go back to St. Anthony. St. Anthony was a great preacher and you'll sometimes see St. Anthony with a Bible, a cross, and the little child Jesus. Here's a little picture of St. Anthony. He's, he's dressed as a Franciscan. He's got the cross in his right hand. If you look closely, he has a child Jesus. And below the child Jesus, you can actually see a book. And that book is the Bible, the Word of God. Many, many portraits or depictions of St. Anthony of Padua. Here's another one from the book of Father Salisman. There we see the child Jesus, and you can see below the child Jesus, you can actually see the Bible. And you can see a, a flower in the hand of Anthony. Flowers because when he was young, he had very strong temptations against purity. And through a prayer and penance, he was able to overcome these temptations. Many of the saints have powerful temptations in many ways. But through the grace of God and their collaboration, they were able to conquer these imperious passions that we all have. St. Anthony. I'd like to tell you uh, one, of the, one of the stories in the life of St. Anthony. It's a charming story. By the way, St. Anthony would preach to thousands of people. And his homilies would sometimes go on for hours. Hours and hours and hours. And the people would be captivated by St. Anthony. I mentioned the fact that he had a Bible. St. Anthony had a photographic memory. He had a photographic memory. He would read the Bible and he would memorize it. Maybe many of us have a photographic memory, but it hasn't been developed yet. You hear that? Many of us, we may have a photographic memory but it hasn't been developed yet. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to develop our photographic memory that we'll be able to memorize more and more the passages from the Word of God. Memorize them, but also to put them into practice. So one occasion, Anthony preached to the people and they didn't pay attention. So he went off to a, a lake and he preached to the fish. And the fish in the lake, they popped out their heads and they listened to the preaching of St. Anthony. How about that? He really believed, well, if people 
people are not going to listen to me. Well, I'll preach to a better audience. So he went and he preached to the fish, and they listened to him. Another charming story in the life of St. Anthony. And this I actually used in my homily last week for Corpus Christi. There was a Jewish man that heard of the Catholic faith and he was studying a little bit of the Catholic faith. And he came across a doctrine called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, which in the consecration of Mass, the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And this Jewish man thought that this was preposterous. How could a piece of bread and wine be turned into God himself? He thought it was preposterous. He thought it was ridiculous. So he told Anthony this. And Anthony said this, okay. I'll make you a deal. I will take, I will find a mule or a donkey. And I have him fast for a week. But she's not going to be eating anything for a whole week. And then we'll bring him into a barn. We'll place on one side of the barn a big pile of hay that donkeys like to eat. Then on the other side we'll, we'll bring the Blessed Sacma, the Eucharist. Now, if the donkey goes and eats the hay, I will be your servant for a certain period of time. However, if the donkey, he pays reverence and homage to the Blessed Sacrament, then you have to believe. Is it a deal? Jewish man, yes, it's a deal. So what happened? The donkey fasted for the whole week. And the donkey was brought inside the barn where there was a pile of hay and there was a blessed sacrament. A lot of people were watching this. And when the donkey arrives, he looks at the hay, ignores it. Then he goes in front of the blessed sacrament and the donkey he bows he inclines, he bows in a posture of adoration toward Jesus truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. And the Jewish man was fascinated as a result of that miracle of the reverential mule. I pray that we'll have more faith than the mule of St. Anthony and the Blessed Sack. Let's pray for that. That Jewish man was converted and his whole family and other Jews were converted. He was converted and he became a fervent Catholic. Then other his family members and others in that place, I think it was in Ravenna or Rimini, one of those two cities, there was a group of Jewish people that were converted as a result of this extraordinary miracle of the mule adoring the Blessed Sacrament. So my friends, that's uh, St. That's Anthony. So St. Anthony went about preaching. preaching and teaching from one town to the next, in Italy, in Belgium, in France. And wherever he went, he was followed, he was followed by huge multitudes of people. Huge multitudes of people. 
St. Anthony had a great love for the poor people. They'd have a problem, he would pray for them. That God would help them in their need. St. Anthony had a, a very, very loving heart. So his, the pace of his apostolic life was so intense, so intense, so exhausting, that St. Anthony, he was worn out. His health was basically destroyed. And no, St. Anthony, my friend, St. Anthony died. He was only 36 years. In a very short time, he had accomplished so very much. And I think that speaks to us. 36 years of age. Many of us are older than that. Let's pray that Let's pray that, like St. Anthony, that we would live out the gospel. That the, the whole parable of the seed planted in the ground, and it's growing little by little at night, without our knowing it, is basically this. The parable of the branch on the top of the mountain, and the parable of the seed planted and growing and growing and flourishing is a symbol for us of the seed of faith that we received in the sacrament of baptism. That we receive this seed in baptism, but the seed has to be cultivated. It has to be watered. You plant a a seed in the ground, you don't water it, you don't cultivate it, you don't place mulch on top of it, you don't practice weeding. And what's going to happen is that seed that you planted, the seed that you plant is going to wither. It's going to dry up. And it's going to die. So that seed has been planted in the very depths of your heart. Let's pray to St. Anthony, let's pray to St. Francis, let's pray to St. Dominic, let's pray to St. Thomas Aquinas, let's pray to St. Albert the Great, let's pray to St. Bonaventure. Let's pray that these great saints allowed the Word of God to take root in their hearts and to grow to blossom, to flourish for an abundant harvest that we would be the branch on the top of the mountain, that we would be the fertile land, the fertile ground, the fertile ground, the fertile seed that can blossom and bring forth fruit and fruit in abundance. Let's turn to Mary. Let's turn to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, who's also known as the Mystical Rose. Let's turn to Our Lady of Fatima, because today is June 13th, which would be the second apparition of Our Lady of Fatima. Let's turn to Mary so that we would bring forth fruit, and fruit in abundance, by meditating upon the Word of God by understanding the Word of God, by loving the Word of God, but especially, my friends, like St. Anthony, known as the Evangelical Doctor, Evangelical Doctor or the Doctor of the, of the Gospel, that we would truly put into practice the Word of God. So I'd like to give you my priestly blessing and rejoice today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.